Hello! Welcome replay viewers and welcome those who are just joining me now. Tonight we are going to continue our discussion on evolution of hominids, specifically our species, Homo sapiens sapien. This um, we do the talk and have a little fun here on Periscope, interact with each other, and then I'm going to cut it down and edit it out a little bit to try to get the main point of the talk, and and I'm going to post that on on YouTube. Title it, the mutation of hominid pigmentation, the story of white skin. <laughs> You enjoy my scopes? Thank you, Chrissy. I enjoy talking with all of the people in my scopes. I have a lot of fun doing them, so hopefully we'll have a lot of fun this evening. Oh, and thank you guys for the hearts. I appreciate and love them. So, we're going to talk about skin color and pigmentation today. Have you ever noticed that? We as a species, right, so we're all Homo sapiens sapien. If you are alive on this planet and you consider yourself a human, if you have all the features that we say that is human, you're part of one specific species of human. There's been lots of species of humans. And our species, Homo sapiens sapien, is the sole survivor. Um, yeah. Uh, when our species first speciated to become Homo sapiens sapien was about 200,000 years ago and at that time there was we weren't the only humans on the planet there was a lot of other human species like the Denevisans and the Neanderthals and there is still Homo erectus around in um, Homo florensis there was by the time we hit the scene there was at least eight to a dozen, maybe more human species walking around this planet. But um, all of those other species have gone extinct. And that's something, our biosphere. It's not that remarkable if you think about it. Within our biosphere, 99% of all species who have ever been on this planet are now extinct. So you know, our planet is rich with life. But our planet knows how to extinguish, extinguish life. That's crazy, yeah. So most of life that's ever existed on this planet is extinct. That's just a fact. Um, but we survived. We're a connected chain of DNA information that's been passing along successfully for 3.8 billion years. Think about that, guys. If you're alive today means you had parents who were alive, who means they had parents who were alive. So think about your maternal line. Think about your mothers, 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 mothers. There's an unbroken chain of going back mothers for 3.8 billion years. And our mothers didn't always look like we do today. So that's basically evolution, guys. <laughs> and that's what this show is. We talk a lot about evolution and specifically about evolution of hominids. So would you guys like me to make a, a quick explanation of hominids before we move on to uh, the skin color? No wonder I'm grumpy or old. <laughs> old is relevant. You're only old if you think you're old. And if you think you're old, compare yourself to the age of a tortoise. You're very young. <laughs> so <clears throat> when we look at hominids, which we are, our species is what's considered a hominid and the way we, I like to say we classify hominids is we look at our closest non-extinct relative which is does anyone know who our non-extinct closest relative is still alive today but the closest in in taxonomy or closest genetically to us the chimpanzees yeah well chimpanzees are apes and we are apes and orangutans are apes and gorillas are apes and bonobos are apes so there's five apes that are not extinct right now and we're one of them so chimpanzees and bonobos exactly bonobos and chimpanzees i'm teaching you well mother you know the bonobo i love the bonobo <laughs> so bonobos chimpanzees and homo sapiens sapiens and every other human species that's ever been alive all had common ancestry about oh hello Ty about five to seven million years ago right so 
if you go back through our mother, 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 mothers, who is an unbroken chain, if you go back seven million years, and you also do the same thing with any chimpanzee or any bonobo who is alive today, and trace back their mother's, 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 mother's line. And if you go back seven million years, it's all connected. There is no bonobos, there is no chimpanzees, there's no humans. It's all the proto, whatever you want to call our common ancestry, right? So that gives us a basis. And so then when we say, what is a hominid? A hominid is something, we find a fossil that's less than 7 million years old. And we look at it, if it's more closely aligned with modern day chimpanzees or modern day bonobos, we would call it a primate's artifact or fossil, right? But if that artifact or fossil is more aligned closely to Homo sapiens sapien, modern day humans that are still non-extinct, um, we would call it a hominid. So that's basically what hominids. If it's not primate and it's within the last seven million years, it's hominid. <laughs> and that's where our direct line goes back through is the hominid line. So you hear me talk about that a lot during our talks. But let's get over to the mutation of our skin. This is going to be fun, guys. Okay, so if your ancestral lineage lived significantly north of the equator in places like northern Europe, like Ireland, even like France, Switzerland, um, then most likely your skin pigment is more mutated than our species' default skin pigmentation. We think about that. So if we take a group, do this as like statistics, any group that you have, you can find a mean, right? The medium, the, the middle, the average. So the mean of our species, and when we talk about our species, we're talking about 200,000 years of genetic information being passed along through a breeding population. And that's what we are. We're a breeding population of a species. Um, your family's from Russia. Yeah, and um, depending on how far back you go also, because think about this, if we go back in time, there was a time when none of our ancestors were in Europe. And that's really not that long ago. Um, we, our species first went to Europe about 30,000 years ago. But backtrack a little bit further, if we go back about 60,000 years ago, um, there is no Homo sapiens sapiens in Europe. They're only in Africa. Yeah, so you look back at least 65 to 70,000 years, going back 200,000 years, you only find our species in Africa. And so if you look at 200,000 years of the mean of our species, the average mean skin color is going to be way darker than my mutated white skin. Um, and there's a good reason for that. <laughs> so the lighter skin is the variant. The lighter skin is what we call a mutation. If you want to call anything a mutation, it mutated away from the norm. So light skin is a mutation of the normal skin of our species. <clears throat> um, so our species has been around for at least 200,000 years. And for more than 130,000 ye 130, of those years, our species ancestors lived below the 35th parallel north. So, okay, I was going to bring a little globe with the skies, but I, I went out of town and I forgot to bring a little globe when it was Ice Age. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's still Ice Age. There's lots of places um, in our planet where it's very icy. Uh, but yeah, most of Europe, there's been several times where most of Europe and Asia has been covered with ice and North America too. And it dips down. So I don't have my little globe or little ball, but we have a sphere. So we can use this sphere we're going to demonstrate as our planet. And look, it has big crevices like Grand Canyons. <laughs> so if you're in the middle of the sphere, what we call the equator, you're going to get a lot more dense sun than if you're further north of the equator. So if you look at the... Oh, this is hard to do. Let me see if I can figure out a little better method here, guys. Okay. So let's look at it this way. Okay. So we have our little sphere, right? <laughs> Freckles and Julie. So we drew a line. Let's see. There's not a really good line here. but So we drew a line across the middle, and we call it the equator. Our species, for most of the time, lived around the equator. So that would have been the norm for our environments. 
And this is really crucial. You say, well, what does the equator have to do with our skin color? We'll get there, guys. <laughs> and <clears throat> a, so we lived below the 35th parallel north and above the 35th parallel to the south. So right in the middle is where our species was around for most of the time until about somewhere between 60 and 70,000 years ago, a portion of our species left. But let's get back on track. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the sun. Important piece of information because our species does not have the ability to generate or metabolize vitamin D. That's why the sun is important to us. Think about that, yeah. So um, vitamin D is very important. Our bodies, we lost the mutation to we lost the ability to mute to um, metabolize vitamin D millions of years ago. Within some of our other vitamins, we can just absorb it and and uh, metabolize it. But we need to get it from you take vitamin D. Yeah, it's important to take vitamin D. We need to get it from either our food source or from another outside source. We can't get it from within ourselves. We we're not going to be able to do that. We can't. A lot of other mammals can. A lot of other mammals don't need the sun for their vitamin D. They don't need the food for the vitamin D. To um, generate and metabolize vitamin D, we need an outside source. And the sources for that, like I said, is food or the sunlight. Yeah. The sun is the main source for our vitamin D. Yeah. So, what is vitamin D? The sun and the location of our ancestors have to do with the pigment of our skin and why within the past 30,000 years, many individuals within our species has had light pigmented skin. That's kind of what the whole talk is about tonight. So think about that. For the majority of the time we've been a species, we have not had light pigmented skin. The majority of the time we've had dark pigment skin, like all of our species. Good journey. So in my talks, we like to get in the a little time traveling mindset, right? <laughs> so I'm going to ask you guys to do that again. So we're going to go back to about 50,000 years ago and, I'm, and we'll take a little bit of a story of why light pigmented skin um, became part of our evolutionary pressures for us. So at 50,000 years ago, we see portions of our species traveling out of Africa and basically turning right because they ran into a bunch of mountains. <laughs> um, yeah, if you go straight out of Africa and you keep going north, you're going to hit the Himalayas. Yeah, and those, those give you a choice. You can't just go over the Himalayas. You either go around up to, to Europe or you go around south down into Indonesia. And that's what the majority of our species did about 50,000 years ago. It went down the south and ended up in Australia. A thousand years ago, our species spreading out all the way to Australia and Southeast Asia. And at that time, we're not really past the 35th um, parallel, right? And so you notice that there is a variance within, within our skin color over many, many, many generations. But if you imagine 50,000 years ago, there wasn't going to be a pressure for a variant within skin. You would have seen the normality of our skin would have been dark pigment um, as we left Africa and as we stayed in Indonesia, in Asia, and down towards Australia. But about 30,000 years ago, some of our species started migrating up towards Europe around the other way of the Himalayas. And when we get up around the other way of the Himalayas, now we run into an issue because we're past the, and I'm just using the 35th parallel as an arbitrary line because I don't really know exactly which line you're gonna, okay, I'm good with dark skin and not getting enough sun, or oh, now I need way more sun because it depends on the variant of your skin, species, where you're located. Um, but the point is, with our natural or our mean of our skin pigment, which is dark, it's not going to be absorbing UV lights mm -hmm. and a lot of the sun's um, photons like we're going to require to get enough vitamin D to survive. So think about that. When you're close to the equator, you're getting a lot of sun photons. <clears throat> 
And when you're away from the equator, you're not getting as much density of light photons, which means you're not getting as much density as vitamin D, which we need. Sun all the time. Yeah. Okay. So let's do a little um, experiment here. Let me set this down. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can get this right. Okay, guys. <laughs> okay. So I have a flashlight. I'm gonna I'm gonna demonstrate this. And here's my my little sphere. So imagine the sun's the sun's hitting our our planet, right? And this is a weak kind of flashlight. It's kind of hard to see with that thing. So you guys can do this at home too. Maybe you have a better flashlight and a little globe or a ball. But when you flash the flashlight like it's the sun shining down on our earth, <laughs> imagine the fly flashlight is shining directly on this globe or sphere. Or from home, put like a globe or sphere from the ceiling in, in a dark room and you can get a flashlight. And you notice in a dark room with the flashlight in your little sphere, that the light will spread out as it approaches the poles. So can you see that? So when the light comes up here, it spreads. And when it's closer to the equator, it condenses. So you get a more concentration of light photons around the equator and more spread out photons when you get closer to the poles, either way, north or south. Go away from the equator, you get less, less sun photons, which means you get less vitamin D. <clears throat> Does anyone know why vitamin D is so important to the health of our species? Yes. Bone strength. Very good. Have you heard of rickets? Um, we had a great demonstration of what rickets can do to a population and to individuals <clears throat> um, back in the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> Think about it. Um, when we had migration, mass migration of our species going from spread out lands where we get lots of sunlight for many hours during the day to condensed city environments like New York, Chicago, and we build these big tall buildings that block out the sun and when people work in factories for 16 hours a day and don't see the sun for months, they get rickets. And when you get rickets, you're going to have a hard time passing on your genetic information, right? And rickets generally affects people at what age? Do we know people? Usually devastate. Not sure. Kids, exactly. They devastate kids. So in the Industrial Revolution, a lot of kids had rickets. And when you have rickets and your bones are twisted and you're barely able to, to take care of yourself and you need basically a lot of help to take care of you to survive, the chances of you passing on your genetic information become slim. That's a serious pressure on you. You get rickets at 12 years old, there's a good chance you're not passing on your genetic information. So, <laughs> so that becomes vitally important. Now, we've seen a good example of that in the Industrial Revolution. Now think back when our ancestors first left the big warm area where we're getting a lot of sun down in Africa, and now we get up into the European areas. and you're not getting enough sun, enough vitamin D into your system to stay off such diseases as rickets. And I think there's a few others that you can get from lack of vitamin D. Long dark winters, yes, it becomes difficult to pass on your genetic information and, and that's what environmental pressures do. They, they either have an advantageous environment to pass on your genetic information or a negative environment to pass on your genetic information or neutral. And our dark pigmented skin, when we went further enough north out of Africa, it became an environmental pressure for our species that some of our species had variants of light skin. So think about that. If you, if you look in, in today in Africa, our species, the most diverse part of our species right now is in Africa. And it always will be uh, because that's where we originate. So you expect the most diversity on a place where you originate. Um, not every African person is, is dark skin. There is a variant within our skin population, right? And that's what evolutionary pressures work on, is variants. And so when a portion of our species went out of Africa, started going north, the ones, the individuals who were able to absorb just enough of vitamin D to stay off rickets and um, to not get a lot of these diseases, 
from lack of vitamin D were able to more successfully pass on their genetic information. And then out of that next generation, maybe there was a few individuals with slightly lighter colored skin which absorbed more vitamin D. Hey James! <clears throat> So that became a key. That became a big player within our species. Can you absorb enough vitamin D when you're further enough north not to get it from the sun? <laughs> and I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. I got carried away. So I'm just kind of reading back. The reason of our species has lighter skin than the other normality of our species. You take that every day, vitamin D. Yeah, that's one of the big reasons why a lot of governments will, will fortify a lot of foods with vitamin D. It's very interesting. And there are cultures and there are portions of our species who survived very far north, away from where the sun is, but changed, adapted their diet to absorb enough vitamin D. Think about um, Inuits, individuals and groups of Inuits and Eskimos. They live very far north and think about their skin color. It's not very white, is it? It's not really light like, like my skin. <laughs> Scurvy and rickets related. I don't know. That's a great question. I, I, I don't study medical anthropology, so I become very ignorant when it comes to medical uh, questions. <laughs> What is the explanation for that? For the dark colored skin of Inuits and Eskimos? <gasps> that is a great question. Now there's going to be portions within the variants. If you're not getting enough sun, there's another source for vitamin D like we do today. We get it within our food source. Um, you can find vitamin C in, such, in some fish. A lot of fish may have vitamin D and like seals eat a lot of seal blubber, you can get vitamin D. So anyone in Eskimo populations and a few other populations around the world, when they got very far north, took relied on vitamin D through their diet. The older we get apparently you have to take you have to take you have to take vitamin D throughout your life. You you simply are not going to survive without vitamin D. Vitamin D and like glucose. You need a constant uh, glucose to feed your brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, our species cannot self-generate its own vitamin D. We lost that ability millions of years ago. Uh, we rely on our diets, on our exposure to the sun. It's, they're both crucial for vitamin D. Um, the, closer you, the closer to the equator, your skin is exposed to a lot more dense photons, um, which you take a lot of vitamin D. So think about this. Um, if you're living close to the equator, like we did our little flashlight experiment that you can do at home, and you shine it on your sphere and you get a lot more dense um, concentration of, of light photons, you're also getting a dense concentration of harmful UV lights. Yeah. UV is dangerous to our skin. UV light causes um, skin damage to us and it can penetrate our skin. Um, just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not harmful and UV light is out of our spectrum range. So, but a great protectant against UV light would be darker and thicker pigment. Great protection. So, for 130,000 years, all of our species had that protection. We had darker pigment, thicker pigment, great protection from the UV lights. Um, not so great when you need to absorb vitamin D to survive. So let me see if I'm missing things right now. Yep, Ari had uh, melanoma. Yeah, um, because there's there's a few types of um, uh, melanin that's that's in our system. There's eumelanin. And I think I'm saying that correctly. It's e u m e l a n i n eumelanin, and the melanin. They, um, that produces brown, black pigment. So that's really dark pigment. And there's also, we have another um, melanin in our system. It's called pheomelanin. Pheomelanin. So P-H-E-O-M-E-L-A-N-I-N. -E yeah, so both of those um, melanins give us skin color. And um, there's always going to be a variance actually produced by um, melancytes, yeah, or so it's it's um, something called the melancortin, the melancortin 1 receptor, 
<laughs> so there's a melancholin 1 receptor, the MC1R. It um, regulates the production of these melan melocytes, right? Yeah. And um, within, within those melocytes, there is a variance. So the variance of these genes is what causes a wide spectrum of phenotypes. So simply by having a wide spectrum of phenotypes within our, our, our genome gives us a, um, a variance of our skin colors. So we're a very adaptable species, I would have to say. As a species as a whole, um, we have enough variance within our species to adapt to pretty much anywhere on this planet. So why pigment, darker, thicker pigment is, is important for our species to protect us from UV damage, right? But we have to find a balance where you live. Um, and evolution has a brilliant way of doing that, natural selection. Yet those of us that, that have to be very cautious in, in the skin is when we get out in the sun, because our skin is, is the thin and, and pale, lacking pigments. It's, think about that, guys. That's a mutation. <laughs> and for many hundreds of years, our society, simply because we're egocentric, would try to say that that's the superior um, variation of skin within our species. But really, it's a mutation, and it's... Uh, I don't see anything that makes one skin color more superior than the other. It's just a variant within our species. The irony, yeah. <laughs> It is aren't a bunch of pasty pale guys used to try to dictate the world by saying my skin color matters more than your skin color. When we look at the biology of it, the reality is the reverse. The, the reality is dark, thick, pigmented skin is the only way our species survived for hundreds of thousands of years. For the most part, I, I try to avoid the sun because I, I simply don't have pigmentation that protects me from harmful UV rays guys. So we established that the pale version of our species skin came from migrating north and environmental pressures that caused that to um, display itself, right? This, we're not the only, nor are we the first human species to leave Africa. Um, <clears throat> so like we said, our species left somewhere between 50 to 60, maybe 65,000 years ago, portion of our species. But before that, Africa, way before we left Africa, in fact, um, if you guys don't mind, we'll, we'll go into a little bit about the Neanderthals, and we we'll might even backtrack a little bit before Neanderthals. Um, well, I should say, the environment that some of our species was in put pressures on us. So our skin, look at look how light my skin is, and this is after only like 30,000 years of mutations from my ancestral line. Neanderthals have literally lived in Europe and Asia for over 200,000 years, maybe as long as three to 400,000 years, maybe even longer. So do you think they had time to adapt to their ability to absorb vitamin D? Right? So who thinks that Neanderthals skin color was dark or who thinks that Neanderthals skin color was light in pigmentation? living above the 35th parallel, way far away from the equator. Light, exactly. Because um, Neanderthals did not possess the ability to metabolize vitamin D either. Like I said, we lost that ability millions of years ago, which meant millions of years ago, us and Neanderthals, common ancestry, were the same. <laughs> um, but Neanderthals weren't the first to leave Europe. In fact, a lot of hypotheses and a lot of the argument with, amongst paleoanthropology is that Neanderthals basically were established in um, Europe. And when I say established, I mean speciated. So if we look at Neanderthals and Homo sapiens sapien, us, at our common ancestor, our direct line, which is Homo heidelbergensis. In Homo heidelbergensis, came about about 800,000 years ago. So about 800,000 years ago, um, Homo heidelbergensis was in Africa, right? And then sometime, we don't know how exact hard dates, when part of Homo heidelbergensis left Africa, just like part of our species left Africa, 
part of Homo heidelbergensis left Africa. And this may have been like a half a million years ago, up to some findings. Um, but for sure, at least by 300,000 years ago, Homo heidelbergensis left Africa. And the portion of that species that were made it up to Europe in that area in Asia, they, over many generations, speciated into Neanderthals. So you don't find Neanderthals. We, won't, we have not found any Neanderthals in Africa. Or they are maybe in Northern Africa, but they're not going down below Sub-Saharan Africa. We don't find Neanderthals. They're, they're farther north. <laughs> Um, and then there's part of the um, Homo heidelbergensis who stayed back in Africa. In that portion of Homo heidelbergensis speciated over many generations into Homo sapiens sapiens. Yay, that's us. That's our ancestors. <laughs> right? And so, um, and after a few hundred thousand years, that species turns speciates into Homo sapiens sapiens. So we've been Homo sapiens sapiens about 200,000 years. And recently, if you look at a geo clock, recently we went back up to Europe. And guess what we found? When we went back up to Europe. We found our closest cousins who've been hanging out there for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, so we went and invaded them. Now think about this, if you think skin color is important for going around <laughs> and being a colonist or whatever, our first colonists leaving Africa were very dark skinned and they ran into a species that was very light skinned. And guess which portion of the species is existing and which is not existing? 30,000 years ago it's the last time we've seen any sign of Neanderthals. They're no longer in existence. There's only Homo sapiens sapiens who came out of Africa, the last ones of the human species that come out of Africa. <laughs> Interbred though, there is a portion of our genome that contains Neanderthal DNA. Yes, if your ancestral line is above Sub-Saharan Africa, so if you're part of that portion of our species who left Africa 50 to 60,000 years ago. Um, you have a portion of Neanderthal DNA within your genome, at least two to six percent. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so if your ancestry came from Europe, you have Neanderthal in you because what happens to our species every time we go to places? Um, Besides conquering other cultures and smashing their culture and changing their culture, we kind of have sex with them too. On trade routes, every time we establish trade routes, we establish a route to pass our genetic information on. And the separation between our species and Neanderthals is somewhere between 300 to 500,000 years. That's a long time to be separated from a cousin, right? And then to get back together with them and able to uh, have some babies along the way. I read one study where they, they um, hypothesized that not all of our ancestors bred with um, Neanderthals because then there would just be our species. It would be blended. So a very small portion of our species and bred with Neanderthals. Um, some say as little as maybe 150 over 30,000 years. Over a long period of time, not many, but there's enough. And think about this, our, our, our species only exploded in population very recently. For a long time our species was in the low thousands numbers, yeah. Uh, we didn't hit a million into our species not that long ago <laughs> in economic times, way after the um, cultivation of agriculture. Before we cultivated agriculture, we had small populations. And so that means that the you have a small population, genetic mutations or genetic changes in our, our information can flow quickly as long as you have the trade routes to breed. <clears throat> yeah. We have, part of our species has light skin because we went north. 
all of Neanderthals would have had light skin because all of them were way far away from the equator. Um, Homo erectus, just like uh, we found in, in, in Asia. Homo erectus has been around for a million, maybe up to two million years in Asia and Africa. They, in Asia and Europe, they left Africa way before the Homo heidelbergensis because Homo erectus was around way before Homo heidelbergensis, before Homo neanderthalis, and Homo erectus actually has been around for at least two million years. That was a very successful species. For two million years, they were around, and, and part of that species speciated into Homo heidelbergensis, which later became us. But part of it went to Asia and Europe, and lots of different species came out of Homo heidelbergensis. I mean, not only Homo heidelbergensis, but also Homo erectus. Like we see Homo florensis. Is. Yeah, Homo florensis um, from the island of Florence in um, Southeast Asia and Indonesia. There is a species that we believe speciated from Homo erectus. Florensis, and not that long ago, recently, we have solid evidence that we found in a species that they call the hobbits. And this is in the 90s. Um, yeah, they found the hobbits because it's a little tiny species. It only stands about uh, three feet high and had a, a, the skull size of not much bigger than an orange, like the pygmies. Um, pygmies are our species. There was a completely different species, the Homo florensis. Yeah, they were, um, they were, we believe, speciated directly from Homo erectus, which Homo erectus is, in our terms, is an ancient species. Sorry, you didn't hear that. Yeah, but the, yeah, the um, hobbits on this island, they only went extinct about 18,000 years ago. 18,000 years ago, there was another species hanging out in, in Southeast Asia with us. Um, now, since they were in Southeast Asia, and they weren't that far north away from the equator, I'm willing to speculate that their skin pigmentation was not very like skin colored. They would have needed protection from the UV lights. So I would, um, I would guesstimate and speculate that that their skin tone was dark. <laughs> so does that help you guys give a, a little perspective on why part of our species has light colored skin and why it's an evolutionary pressure that once have been just applied to us but to any human species that uh, that migrated above the 35th parallel or below the 35th parallel to the south. So below the like way above the Tropic of Cancer or Capricorn, Tropic of Cancer. Which ones are the tropics, guys? There's Capricorn and Cancer. I don't know which one is which. <clears throat> but if you stay within those tropical zones, you'll see species with dark colored skin. <laughs> but I think I'm going to close up this talk, guys. Um, I would love some feedback on your talk, on this talk. So give me some comments on YouTube. It's great. Thank you for hanging out with me, guys. And, and I try to. One of my goals, um, when, when I learn something, like when I'm in class and, and, and I'm taking a specific class, that my measuring stick to, to know if I learn the material well enough is if I can explain it to a 10-year-old. That's my mission. If I take everything I learn from the evolution of skin, so to say, like we talked tonight, if I can turn around and explain that to a 10-year-old where a 10-year-old can understand it clearly, I was like, yeah, I, I understand the material then. You notice my talks, it's, I'm, I try not to get too technical and, and I try not to talk over people's heads and sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm over explaining things to people because my mentality is I want, I want to make sure that a 10-year-old is going to understand because that's who's going to benefit from these talks. Love y'all. Goodbye. Thank you for the hearts. Thank you for hanging out. Be good to each other. Be good to yourself. I love you too. Love yourself and learn to like yourself. <laughs>